in his family to earn a college degree. After college, he returned home to Cortez and co-founded the Mesa Verde Indi Indian Pottery. That's correct, stuff. yeah. Um, a small business that he had uh, ran successfully for about 30 years. Scott uh, was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives in 2010. Uh, he currently serves on the Committee on Finance Services, is the co-founder of the Congressional Small Business Caucus, and vice chairman of the Congressional Western Caucus. In all of these roles, he has championed issues, critical issues, to the success of Colorado's third district, working to advance policies and or policies that jumpstart growth on Main Street and foster a vibrant economic climate so that all Americans have an opportunity to earn that paycheck and to strive for the American dream. So without further ado, I present to you, Congressman Kitty. Thanks. Thanks, Keith. Thanks, well, thanks, Keith, and a real pleasure for me to be able to have the opportunity to be able to be here with you this morning, to be on the PCC campus. And I uh, didn't know if you knew, but uh, I actually served on the board of PCC for a period of time. My father had as well. Uh, one of the proudest moments, my dad, as Keith had noted, I'm the first of my family uh, on either side, my mom or dad, to be able to go to college and have the opportunity to be able to give a, get a degree. When my dad was on the board and uh, here for a period of time, he got an honorary degree from PCC, uh, which we still proudly display in our home now. So uh, the value of what is accomplished here at this campus, uh, the opportunities that this is going to provide for people to be able to get a job and to be able to provide for their families is something that is uh, literally near and dear to my heart. And if you aren't familiar with the uh, 3rd Congressional District of Colorado, as Keith noted, uh, I'm out of Cortez, but I've got some deep ties right here in Pueblo. If you've been around here a little while, uh, there used to be the old Walters Brewery. Uh, my mom worked for the recept as a receptionist for Mr. Walters. My dad was working with a construction company. He is born in Bayfield, but working with a construction company that was doing an expansion on what was then CF&I and now Everest Steel. They met on a blind date on a Friday the 13th here in Pueblo, Colorado. Ended up getting married. My brother was born here. So we spent a lot of time actually uh, here as my grandparents have moved out here. And Pueblo is always a, a place that always has a special place literally in my heart. But our district does cover 29 of the 64 counties of the state of Colorado. We have 54,000 square miles of the state and uh, just had an opportunity to visit with a gentleman who moved here from Houston, Texas. I like to be able to tell our colleagues out of Texas, if we flattened out our district, we'd be bigger than the state of Texas. We've got a huge area uh, to be able to cover. But one thing that I'm incredibly passionate on here in the state of Colorado, I think we see a tale of two economies, and these are some issues that we're dealing with uh, in Congress. Uh, it's not only replicated here in our state, but literally around the country as well, to where we have some pockets of prosperity. Uh, Denver is doing reasonably well. But as we move out of that metropolitan area, we're continuing to see the challenges for our more rural communities to be able to maintain jobs that they currently have and to be able to create new jobs as well. Those are some issues that uh, I, I want to be able to work on and to be able to create those opportunities in the private sector uh, to be able to get people literally back to work. Because as we travel through our communities, and Pueblo is an incredibly uh, good example of a great workforce that's available. When you come into PCC, they're willing to be able to sculpt courses to be able to meet those business needs uh, so that we can actually create jobs right here at home. And we look at the offerings in, in a community like Pueblo with the interstate, we have an airport, uh, great opportunity uh, to be able to actually build businesses and to be able to get people back to work. But a lot of this is actually being impacted by policy and I always like to be very clear, I don't think that any policy uh, that has been put in is ever meant with malintent. The heart is always in the right place. But I spent 30 years of my life, as Keith had noted, in the private sector. Started my own business right out of college and operated that for 30 years. Had a very simple premise that I like to be able to work off of. That if it's broken, fix it. If you can't, stop doing it. 
And I think that's something we really need to be able to replicate in Washington as well. To be able to have a look back provision, to be able to see if those policies are actually achieving the goal, and the goal needs to be to be able to create a fertile ground for businesses to be able to prosper because that means that we have jobs, opportunities for people to be able to provide for their families. One issue that I'm working on right now, I'm part of a task force, it's called Article One. And that's to be able to get Congress back into the rulemaking authority. Uh, any rule, any regulation that is coming out of the bureaucracies right now becomes, uh, once it is final, effectively the force of law. Here in Colorado, we actually do some pretty good things. Uh, we have sunset legislation. To our state legislators, we'll have the opportunity to be able to bring in the departments, the agencies, to be able to look at the rules, the regulations that are promulgated, and to be able to see if legislative intent was met or if it was succeeded. Good policy uh, to be able to have. Unfortunately, in Congress, we did not have that opportunity. Once a rule, once a regulation goes final and has that full effect of law, if Congress wants to be able to actually address that, we have to resort to something that is called a CRA, a Congressional Review Act. And we can only disapprove a rule or regulation. But I've been in business, and I understand that once a rule or regulation is coming forward, and it looks like it's going to go final, we have to tool up for it. We have to be able to respond to make sure that we are complying with what is effectively law to be able to address it. Would it be sensible for Congress to do exactly what the state of Colorado does? To be able to have that look back provision. That's something that we're working on. I just passed a bill uh, out of the Financial Services Committee to be able to address something that is critical for business as well. That's access to capital. Our small community banks are feeling uh, great cost increases that are a result of Dodd-Frank. Now we had a financial crisis that went on. Did there need to be some new rules and regulations? You bet. But one size fits all doesn't work all of the time. We see those impacts flowing down to our community banks, inhibiting their ability to be able to provide the services that is so critical to effectively making sure that our communities literally work. Nobody knows our, our communities better than our local bankers, and they want to be able to make those loans, but they're being challenged as those rules and regulations come out. The Taylor Act that we just passed out of the Financial Services Committee and will move on to the floor of the House of Representatives is going to require that rules and regulations are going to be sculpted to be able to meet the size, the risk portfolio of the institution, and it has this very important component, a look back provision, uh, to where any rules and regulations that are promulgated will literally come back to the committee uh, to see if that legislative intent was not met or if it was exceeded. It can go both ways. So I think a positive step forward, maybe a template that we might want to be looking at for broader based legislation as well uh, that moves through the House of Representatives. And I know we have some students that are in here right now uh, doing a, a little bit of study on, on the civics end of it. Uh, we have uh, the two houses, obviously, of Congress, 435 members here in the state of Colorado. We have seven members uh, that uh, represent the uh, House side and then, of course, our two United States Senators. And I'm really pretty pleased to be able to report to you that uh, as a delegation when it comes to Colorado-centric issues, uh, we have a lot of collaboration that goes on in our delegation to be able to try and make sure that we're addressing the needs, the concerns of our state and to be able to make sure that uh, we're working as effectively as, as we can for the constituencies across uh, one, of the, one of the best states, obviously, in the country. A uh, number of issues that we will have coming up, we have what is called WOTUS or Waters of the U.S., uh, which is something that uh, I think as Coloradoans we're pretty much united on to make sure that we're state law is going to be respected, our priority based systems and private water rights as well. Uh, we are also going to be having something called TPP, which when we're talking about jobs, coming up the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Here's some good news. For the first time, as citizens, and by the way, for members of Congress as well, we have the opportunity to actually read the trade agreement uh, before it is presented for a vote. That was because of the Trade Promotion Authority. So we're reaching out throughout our district to talk to the various constituencies, had an opportunity to be able to visit with Evers on some of their concerns on the Trans-Pacific Partnership. It has not been introduced, it has not been voted on, uh, and uh, it will take 90 days once the legislation is actually 
actually introduced for it to be able to move forward. But trade is critically important and I think that we can hopefully all agree that uh, we like trade uh, but we want to make sure that we have fair trade. Uh, that we're going to be able to protect the businesses that we have. Uh, competition is a good thing. Nobody, I, in my mind, will compete better, innovate better, and provide a better service or a product than American business. But we've got to be able to have a fair trading uh, field on which to be able to play as well. So those are the examples that we're reaching out, trying to be able to learn uh, from our folks here in our district whether or not this legislation uh, will actually best serve our interests uh, to be able to promote and protect jobs that we currently have and hopefully to be able to create new jobs as well. So between rules and regulations, as uh, many of you probably have noticed, we haven't seen a lot of bills that have actually become law uh, moving through. But the rules and regulations, uh, the impacts that we're seeing on businesses and our opportunity uh, to create those job opportunities are being greatly impacted. Uh, some issues that we're working on through the Financial Services Committee and as Keith had noted, uh, we're also incredibly engaged uh, on a lot of our, our uh, third congressional district centric issues uh, from forest health to water uh, to being able to have a responsible energy development in our district as well. I've introduced legislation, we passed it through the House of Representatives before called Planning for America's Energy Future Act, which literally calls for all of the above. Wind, solar, geothermal, hydroelectric, oil, gas, oil, shale, coal, minerals, uh, to be able to create American jobs and to be able to create American energy security as well. The education end of this, uh, we have a bill uh, that uh, we're trying to be able to move forward. Uh, to be able to try and provide some opportunities as well for education, which is going to be critically important for the future of every person. And if you happen to be a veteran and had the opportunity to visit with a couple of vets and uh, just over at the jobs fair as well, uh, we do want to let everyone know that our office is available. A variety of benefits do exist and we need to make sure that we're fulfilling that promise that was made to our veterans when they went into the service. Uh, there are great educational opportunities and uh, through our office here in Pueblo we want to make sure that uh, you know that door is open. Uh, many avenues we may be able to help on. So it's a real pleasure for me to be able to be here with you this morning. A few things that we're working on in Congress and if you had any questions I'd be delighted to do my best to be able to answer them. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Do we have any questions? Anybody? Okay, looks like we have one over here. Um, and I know that uh, you're in the U.S. Congress, and, and uh, this is everybody's favorite topic, uh, marijuana. And mm -hmm. it's not whether it's, I know it's federally still illegal, so we will hear, this is not about legality or illegality or morally right or wrong. It's about natural resources. It is a water intensive industry that in this area has come into a not so water intensive uh, resource. So the question is, is there a way that you can influence or somehow we can say influence legislation that will say we can only have so many grow houses per hundred square miles or whatever that is simply because it is so water intensive and water is a precious resource here and Colorado has a, a water plan um, that just doesn't seem to consider that water intensive industry coming into a very dry area. Right and uh, you're exactly right this is actually an issue uh, for our state legislature to perhaps be discussing. Uh, it's nothing that we're going to see on the, on the federal end of the world. Uh, certainly respectful of the vote uh, that we had here in the state of Colorado. Have had a number of conversations. Uh, some have included uh, some of the water consumption. Uh, we've also met uh, with some people that are in the hemp industry, uh, you know, which can be used for clothing, uh, you know, a variety of industrial applications, which is lower water use. Uh, that is there and uh, I think that uh, this is something that uh, we need to be having a discussion on uh, in our state. Uh, water is absolutely critical, uh, uh, greatly opposed frankly, uh, the buy and dry mentality to be able to move our water out of our, our different basins and uh, to build Denver. Nothing against Denver, but we want to be able to grow our communities. We need to make sure that we've got those agricultural products uh, to be able to feed our families and, and the jobs that are created and the collateral jobs as well 
well uh, from that farm and ranch community. But uh, you're exactly right. Uh, that, that is not an issue that the federal government specific to Colorado will be involved in, but a, a great opportunity to be able to reach out to our lo uh, local state legislators as well. And okay. Uh, you know, uh, we, we have conversations and uh, they say my advice is exactly worth what they paid for. So, <laughs> yes sir. Congressman Tipton, first I want to thank you for being here at Public Community College today. It's a great honor to have you. So thank you so much. I was curious more about the Trans-Pacific Partnership. I, was, I know that uh, there's a lot of constituencies are very for it, a lot of constituencies are very much against it. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of fear that this partnership could take away jobs from America. Could you elaborate more on how this could benefit our community or how it could have a negative impact on our community? You, bet, you know, through our office, and I do appreciate that question, uh, we're trying to be very cautious with this and we're trying to be able to reach out to the people who will know specifically for their industries the issue actually the best. Uh, there was a lot of concern after NAFTA, CAFTA, uh, that we saw jobs uh, that maybe left the country. And uh, again, uh, there isn't an American that I know. Uh, we were just talking football up there. We love competition and we will compete, uh, but we've got to be able to make sure that we've got a fair playing field to be able to participate on as well. So now uh, through what was called the TPA, which was the Trade Promotion Authority, which every president effectively has had, uh, this opened the door in the legislation that we put in. Uh, it has some actual litmus test requirements, uh, expectations out of Congress. We want to make sure that we aren't endangering American jobs, uh, but creating a fair opportunity to be able to compete. Uh, and this has opened the door literally for us all to be able to read that legislation. And uh, so right now it is in, in a study period and we want to be able to get the feedback. Uh, I happen to support trade. Uh, you know, I think it's a great thing uh, for us to be able, and we have the empirical evidence that you probably studied here at PCC, that uh, when we do export, we create more jobs, we create higher paying jobs uh, to be able to get Americans back to work. But we want to make sure that we've got a fair deal for our businesses literally to be able to compete. And so uh, we're doing exactly what you're speaking to. Uh, we're reaching out uh, to our farm and ranch community, uh, who generally right now is supportive. Uh, when we're talking with the steel industry, when we visited with Everas a few days ago, uh, they were concerned about some dumping that was going on. And it is important to note through TPP, China is not part of the T Trans Pacific Partnership. Uh, it's the rest of the, the countries that are, that are in the Orient going down, uh, will include uh, you know, some activity, obviously, uh, engaging with uh, uh, Australia as well. But uh, you know, we're dealing with that uh, Pacific region in terms of the trade, and let's just make sure we've got a great deal. Uh, trade is a good thing. Uh, when you start trading with people, I think uh, we, we've seen the benefits of that. Uh, it lowers a lot of temperature on other political issues that may come up, uh, creates opportunities here at home, and uh, we're gonna continue to examine this, and as you're looking through it, we'd love to be able to get your feedback. Thank you. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, Congressman Tiffin, I'm uh, Dean of Arts and Sciences. some states have shot themselves in the foot by bringing in businesses and providing such lavish tax breaks and subsidies that they those outstrip the sum total of the wages or the payroll that's delivered to the mm -hmm. state. Uh, what are your thoughts on that and how do we avoid that here? You know, I think that, uh, and again, this is something at uh, the state legislative level and, fr and frankly at the community level as well because we have economic de uh, development councils in most of our communities uh, throughout uh, the state of Colorado and certainly in the third congressional district uh, to make sure that, uh, again, we're getting a good deal. Uh, you know, that we're going, to, uh, if jobs are coming in, we've got to make sure that we've got uh, an actual guarantee that's going to be coming in. If they fail to do that, that needs to be in the incorporating agreement, uh, that there is a consequence associated with that uh, to make sure that our con uh, com communities are literally covered and, and protected. And uh, we have a program right now in Jumpstart Colorado uh, that the gov governor is advocating, uh, which in some respect, it's not a bad template. Uh, you know, to be able to bring in to where we don't have competition to be able to fill in some of those voids. 
and uh, as we go through every community, uh, maybe, maybe it's something as simple as trying to bring in a shoe store. A uh, community doesn't have a shoe store. Uh, to be able to try and incentivize somebody, somebody locally maybe to be able to start that business, to be able to fill a market void in the communities, but when we're bringing in some of the outside businesses, uh, it's looking out the windshield. Uh, you know, in, in a business, uh, when you're getting ready to make an investment, when you're getting ready to make uh, uh, increases in your payroll costs, you had to be able to look out that windshield in terms of the long-term costs. Uh, that we're going to be associated with that. And I think the best thing we can do as a community, as a state, uh, is to look at that in, its in, in toto uh, to make sure that uh, we're serving the best needs of the community. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. make sure that we not only stay in compliance with the federal financial aid regulations, but to make sure, most importantly, that our students have the best information to utilize those uh, apparently more limited resources. And knowing, again, that community colleges are the best educational bang for your buck. Thank yes. you very much. <laughs> but all these deep in the night, midnight talk shows now are talking about the student loan bubble breaking, coming soon you know, the, the scare tactics. What's the reality of that? Yeah, we have seen, uh, you know, there's, there's certainly, we've got, uh, when, we, when we look at uh, from a 30,000 foot view, as a country, we now have a $19 trillion debt. Uh, all of these different elements do come into play. And again, it goes back to this question. Uh, let's be looking at the windshield in terms of some of the obligations that are made. The investment that we make in education is something that has a very positive return obviously. Uh, to be able to have an educated population, uh, be it a four-year degree, a trade degree, uh, all of these come into play to make the American economy literally work. And uh, in terms of, uh, I think we need to be addressing some of the costs that are associated when we talk about PCC, we're talking about affordable education. Uh, in terms of uh, some of the other alternatives uh, that are out there. In fact, I brought up PCC. We just had a uh, financial uh, meeting with uh, students over in Bayfield not long ago and uh, had the opportunity to be able to say, when you're looking for educational opportunities, you can look at choices like PCC, uh, Fort Lewis College, where I graduated, uh, to make affordable, good choices to where you're going to invest your dollars or to be able to take out a loan uh, for that education. Uh, you know, I think there have been, had a number of questions that have been raised at uh, a number of different meetings that we've had uh, with some of our state institutions to where we've seen their uh, fees for uh, tuition go exceed uh, by many times the rate of inflation in this country. And has the question been asked, why? Uh, to make sure that we're making that education literally affordable for our students uh, in the education end of the world, to make sure that we're delivering degrees that actually create an opportunity for our students to be able to earn a living. And uh, we'd had an example that was given that, uh, you know, if you do a study on, uh, you know, the, the Roman Coliseum and get your degree in that, there probably aren't going to be a lot of job opportunities to be able to make that really marketable. However, if you can come here and learn how to weld, uh, you know, if you're actually getting a degree that's going, uh, we just met with uh, Ball Industries and, and Lockheed Martin. Uh, the Lockheed Martin, by the way, has 500 jobs that they're touting right now that are available in Colorado. Some different skill sets. Let's make sure that those degrees actually have an opportunity uh, to be able to uh, get a job for those students, to be able to pay back those loans. Uh, and, and make sure, because I, I know as students uh, with mine, I, I'd worked when I was in college uh, to be able to cover some of the costs that were going to be associated with that. Uh, when you sign contracts, you have an actual debt that is incurred. And uh, we need to make sure that we are making it affordable, but also uh, having those job opportunities once they step out the door to actually earn a living and then uh, to be able to make some of those repayments. But uh, this is a challenge that we are going to have to be looking at, and uh, uh, this needs to be part of a broader conversation. Okay. Yes, sir. Andrew Foster, President of Associated Student Government. I have colleagues at CSU Pueblo who recently were speaking with Governor Hickenlooper about the budgets for the state and 
acknowledging that $20 million is being, was up for cutting for state education. Mm -hmm. Now, through the process that they went through, they were managed, they managed to make that final number look more like $0.3 million. I, I, forgive me if I'm wrong on those numbers. Uh, I'm curious though, and I did have the distinct pleasure of meeting Governor Hickenlooper last week when I was in town. Uh, how do we reverse the trend of wanting to take money away from education in the state and start putting more money back into education? Mm -hmm. Can you speak on this for a moment, sir? Well, and this is where uh, I think at the government level, uh, we need to be doing some prioritization. Uh, you know, when we look at the federal end, fortunately in the state of Colorado, we do have to balance our budget. It's required. Uh, on the federal end, it is not required, and we're seeing a $19 trillion debt, and we cannot overstate actually the impact of that on our economy because every dollar that we are paying in interest is one less dollar that's going to be available uh, to maybe provide for education, uh, to be able to do, uh, uh, to fulfill a promise to a veteran, uh, to make sure that those resources are literally going to be there. And uh, I think that this gets in at the state uh, legislative level where uh, you are pointing to and then certainly at the federal level as well uh, to make sure that we're doing some responsible things uh, with resources that are going to be available. Uh, when I went into Congress, it was uh, interesting. I spent 30 years in the private sector. I haven't been a career politician. And uh, it was, uh, the, somebody did a study and only 18% of us had actually worked in the private sector. Uh, so understanding how those dollars are going to be spent, uh, and again, I, I will underscore, uh, there is not a program that's been created, there isn't a policy that's been put forward uh, to where uh, somebody is saying, we're really going to get the American people with this one. It's all done with a good heart. Uh, we'd, we'd like to be able to do everything, but just like with our families, uh, there are areas to where you're going to have to prioritize, some things you're going to have to hold back on. Uh, but a real key for us when we're looking at more money for education, uh, when we're looking at paying down the national debt, uh, it's getting America back to work. Uh, right now, and I know we're, we're seeing it here when we're talking about Pueblo and uh, the communities, and we're seeing it in Grand Junction, our two largest communities in our district right now, we're experiencing that lowest labor participation rate in four decades. Uh, when we look at that $2 trillion which is being paid out right now, in regulatory costs. That's increasing costs of goods and services across the board, uh, impacting families' abilities to be able to provide for themselves. And uh, do when, when we do talk about rules and regulations, uh, uh, I do always like to point out, I'm not anti-rule and regulation. Uh, we need some rules. We need some guidelines to be able to work off of. But just like we do in business, we also need to make sure uh, that we're doing it in a sensible way. We're looking back. If it's not working, stop doing it. If it's broken, fix it. Uh, that has to be a policy to address. It. But uh, we're probably stripping away, Andrew, a lot of the resources that we have for education and, and, and a number of other things that we'd like to be able to do, uh, to be able to support our local police force, to make sure they've got the resources that they need, uh, to be able to address a variety of issues as well. Uh, as we're continuing to spend more uh, and expanding the scope of government, as we bring it back, had, had an opportunity to just visit with Catholic Charities before I came in does some remarkable work locally uh, to be able to help people in need in a variety of different areas. Uh, looking at some of these groups, uh, rather than create another government program, if we're leaving some of those resources here at home and in your pocket, in my mind, uh, we're going to be able to create some better opportunities for the future. Great. Well, I really appreciate you letting me join you this morning, and uh, thank you all for taking time out of your day. And again, I want to give a, a, my thanks to PCC and, and to Colorado Pueblo Workforce as well uh, for our Jobs Fair program uh, here this afternoon. And uh, feel free once again to be able to reach out to our office. Thank you for letting me join you. Thanks.